Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Hannah Fries, and I'm a writer editor in the Library of Congress publishing office. And thank you. I'm delighted to welcome you here for a performance from the theatrical adaptation of Rudolf Fischer's 1932 novel, The Conjure Man Dies. The library uh, recently reissued The Conjure Man Dies in its Library of Congress Crime Classics series, which is published in association with Poison Pen Press. And the series brings back into print some of the finest American crime writing from the 1860s to the 1960s, showcasing rare and lesser known titles that represent a range of genres from cozies to police procedurals. In addition to reproducing the original text, each book includes a critical introduction and annotations by our series editor, Leslie S. Klinger, as well as cover art drawn from the library's collections. And our hope is for these books to start conversations, inspire further research, and bring obscure works to a new generation of readers. The National Book Festival and the Publishing Office staff are exploring innovative ways that books can be performed. And today we will present Act One, Scene One of the play that Rudolf Fischer adapted from his novel. The Federal Theater Project, a New Deal program that provided grants to actors, directors, and other theater professionals during the Great Depression, staged Fisher's adaptation in 1936 at the Lafayette Theater in Harlem. And the production was so successful, it was revived after its four-week run and performed in New York City parks and open-air theaters throughout the summer of 1936 with more than 60,000 people estimated to have seen the play. Today, we're proud to share on the large screen uh, photographs from the original production, which are part of the Federal Theater Project's archives that are held at the library's music division. Before introducing our performers, uh, I'm thrilled that Les Klinger has joined us from Los Angeles, where he is an attorney by day and an expert in the history of mysteries and horror fiction all of the time. Les is considered one of the world's foremost experts on Sherlock Holmes, Dracula, and H.P. Lovecraft, and he has authored and annotated many books on these literary giants. He brings his deep knowledge of the mystery genre to his annotations in, for the Library of Crime Classics series. And he'll provide some background on The Conjure Man Dies. And then after our performance, he'll be back to speak more about the book and answer questions. So thank you again for joining us. And I will turn the podium over to Les. Thanks, Hannah. Um, one, of the, one of the phrases that Hannah didn't use about this series is time machines. I think that that's what we've been trying to produce here. Uh, these books are windows on their eras, and they're not all pleasant. Um, they are not all politically correct, but they are, I think, a very accurate depiction of the times. The Conjure Man Dies, published in 1932, was one of the, uh, the great fruits of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, the Renaissance was ebbing already at that time as the Depression began. But we selected this book for the series for two reasons. One, it's the first mystery novel by a black writer to feature an all-black ensemble of characters. Uh, it's set in Harlem. Uh, and so it is in that way, it's very evocative of a specific time when the white culture of New York had discovered uh, black culture. Um, and the other reason is it's a great mystery. Uh, it's, a, it's a puzzling mystery. And Fisher, you won't, we're not going to do the whole thing here. You're not going to solve the crime in this performance. Uh, uh, for that, you have to actually read the book. Uh, but. It's a, it's a terrific mystery, and the author combined um, 
his love of crime fiction, he clearly knew the work of Dashiell Hammett and some of the other early uh, pioneers in the field. But it also is a very realistic book. Uh, the book has, is filled with uh, Harlem slang uh, and a great sense of the culture of Harlem at that time. Uh, so in today's performance, we're only going to see there are actually five detectives in this story. Uh, we're going to meet three of them in this scene. Dr. Archer, um, who is very much in the tradition of physician detectives. Fisher himself, the author, by the way, was also a physician, much as Arthur Conan Doyle was. Uh, Bubber Brown and Jinx Jenkins. Bubber and Jinx are denizens of Harlem. Uh, they all live in Harlem, actually. Dr. Archer is being played by Jonathan Del Palmer, Bubber Brown by Joshua Street, and Jinx Jenkins by Travis Brown. And now, on with the show. Hmm. It's one advantage of being an undertaker. You don't have to fear robbers. <sighs> not a twitch. Long gone, huh, Doc? Mm, not so long. Only about half an hour, but gone. What I tell you? So, this was Frimbo. Conjure man, caster of spells, prophet. <laughs> I wonder if he foresaw his own. Oh, hello. <laughs> what, what is it, Doc? Ah, blood in his hair. Scalp wound, hmm? Who are you two, gentlemen? Uh, Why, uh, this is uh, Jinx Jenkins, uh, Dr. Archer. He, he's my buddy, see? Him and me... And you, if I don't presume. Me? I, I'm Bubba Brown. <laughs> Just how did this happen, Mr. Bubba Brown? Indeed, uh -huh. I don't know, Doc. What, what, is somebody killed him? You don't know? Me? No, sir. <laughs> you came and got me. You must know something about it. Who found him? Jinx. <laughs> Where? Same place you did. Upstairs in that funny room of his. In that chair? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> but how? You see, we just come here to get his advice about something. Jinx took his turn. I waited in the waiting room. Presently, Jinx come busting out Popeyes and beckoned to me. Uh, I, I went back with him, and there was Frimbo, just like you found him. Mm -hmm. We didn't know he was already over the river. That's how come I run across the street for you. Hmm. Did he fall against anything and strike his head? Go. Oh. Tell the doc you was in the room with the man. Not while he was talking to me, but I know it could have happened, though. When? Well, you told us to bring him down here so you could see him in a better light. Yes. Well, maybe we bumped his head on the banister or something? In which case, the wound would not have bled since the victim is already dead. Good. Uh -huh. Would just getting hit on the head kill him? It might, but it didn't. This isn't a fatal wound. Well, well what, what done it then? Patience, my friend. Let's see. Uh, contorted features, retracted lips, bulging eyes. Frimbo was choked to death. Choked? Yet there are no marks on his throat. Anyone else present when this happened? Uh, there was uh, two ladies in the waiting room. Uh, they up there yet, I reckon, wondering what's the holdup. No one else. Well, uh, uh. there was three men. Uh, went and see Frimbo ahead of us. Uh, uh, Jinx was the fourth, but, but the others must have left by the hall door. Uh, you gentlemen will pardon my undue curiosity, I hope, but which of you, if either, stands responsible for the, um, 
expenses of medical attention in this case? Expenses? I mean, who gonna pay you? <laughs> that makes it a rather bald question. <laughs> bald? Well, here's one with hair on it, Doc. Who's getting the medical attention? Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Seems I must seek my compensation in something other than the coin of the realm. Uh, well, what's money but a means of satisfaction? Oh, show, show, show. This case may satisfy my native curiosity yet, if not my cellular protoplasm. <laughs> you follow me, of course. With my tongue hanging out. In other words, gentlemen, suppose we notify the police. The police? <laughs> yes, the police. Uh, you know, the police. Why, uh, no, you, we'll, we'll go get them. Won't we, boy? Come on. Uh, just a moment, gentlemen. <laughs> All first-rate undertakers have telephones. <laughs> oh, you mean just Call him up. I think you'll find Mr. Crouch's telephone uh, in there. In there? In there. If you see a body or two lying around, just ignore them. I'll check up here. A body? Hmm. <laughs> Police. He'll check up in there, and we'll just about check out in here. I wish I could check out. This thing don't look so good to me. All right, Dumbo, check out and make everybody think you done it. Well, it's us thought that. Oh, oh, what look the there. Oh, another one. What I tell you? Uh, graveyards a playground compared to this place. <laughs> Where's the phone? Look, don't ask me. I got both of my eyes occupied. <laughs> there it is. Right by the thing. <laughs> Go on. Use it. Use it yourself. I'm going out of here. Not alone. Come on. We use it together. All right. But if that who's is say howdy, then I'm saying goodbye. Where the hell you think I'm going to be when it say howdy? Church in the basement, Undertaker on the first floor, and the conjure man upstairs. Roll, Jordan, roll. Step on it, slow motion. H hello? H hello? H operator? Operator? My God, is the phone dead too? Opera oh, here she is. Okay. Give me the station, quick. Pennsylvania? No, no ma'am, New York. Harlem. Listen, lady, not railroad. Police. Yeah, police station. Please, ma'am. Hello? Is this, is this? Hey! Send a flock of cops around here. Big cops. Frimbos. Mm -hmm. The conjure man on 130th Street. Yep, somebody done put that thing on him. Mm -hmm. How? You'll have to ask Doc Arch about that. He's right here in the next room. Huh? Okay, but make it fast. Uh, hello? Uh, 18 West 130th Street. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> wait right here. We'll wait. But not right here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, find anything else, Doc? Yes. What? A brand new way of choking a man to death. Oh, come on back, guys. Come on back.
I'm sure you all saw what the doctor did there. Pulled out, and uh, this is a little tiny spoiler here, but he pulls a handkerchief out of the throat of the corpse. Who put a handkerchief down the corpse's throat? And by the way, the handkerchief belongs to Jinx Jenkins. <laughs> the plot thickens. Um, there are two other detectives featured in the book. Uh, Perry Dart, who is a black police detective, uh, and he becomes sort of a partner to Dr. Archer. Uh, they work together on this case, and there's actually another story about Archer and Dart. Um, and uh, a fifth detective, who you'll have to read the book to find out who it is. There's a lot of surprises in this book. So if the early 1920s to mid-30s was the Harlem Renaissance, then the author Rudolf Fischer was truly a Renaissance man. Born in 1897 in Washington, uh, he attended How uh, Brown University. Uh, he was raised in Providence, actually, and then he attended Brown. He also went to uh, Howard, where he obtained his uh, medical degree. He was a well-known radiologist in New York. He, uh, he wrote papers in the field, but he also played music. He was a regular habitué of Harlem. He, he played with various bands, and he was a writer. He was friends with Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Houston, and the other luminaries of the Renaissance. Um, people have suggested, as I said, that, that he had studied Hammett um, in particular. And as you can tell from this, he combined crime with realistic views of Harlem. There was a lot of debate in the Renaissance at that time about how the black culture should be depicted what black writers' obligations were. Should they be presenting the noble, the best? Fisher decided that he wanted to present a realistic picture of Harlem, and so he did. Barbara Brown is not the clown that you saw a glimpse of here. Uh, Jinx is not the, mm, he's a little, he's kind of suspicious. Uh, and Dr. Archer has his own long story about how he got to be a physician practicing here. And Perry Dart, um, one of the tiny handful of black detectives on the police force in New York at that time. So it's a, it's a very focused look at what was going on in the culture. So as I said, this is the first novel by a black writer with an all black cast. There hadn't been very many, many people of color writing before this. One of the most important is Pauline Hopkins. She wrote, um, she was the editor of the Colored American Magazine uh, from 1901 to 1903, and she produced two novels of great importance. One is called Of One Blood, which is uh, essentially sort of a lost world. If you, if you think Wakanda, she invented it. Uh, of One Blood is in part about that and, and about uh, a black artist assimilating in white culture in America, only to discover his roots. The other book called Hagar's Daughter um, is a crime novel um, with a, a female detective um, with roots of the crime in slavery. Um, these are very important works um, and just about forgotten today. Um, there were only two other uh, works by people of color that we know of in the crime fiction field. One was called The Black Sleuth. Uh, it was serialized, so it doesn't count as the first novel, and it's not quite finished. Um, and the other is um, a novel by, um, I'm looking for his name at the moment, uh, The Hunt is uh, W. Adolph, Adolph Roberts. Uh, this book was published in 1926. It's called The Haunted Hand. Um, uh, Roberts was a Jamaican who had moved to the United States at an early age, but there is nothing black about the book at all. Um, it's a, the detective is a, a white Brooklyn-born lowlife who turns, uh, who turns out to be important in, in finding things out about the case. So Fisher stands out as the first great writer of color. 
Um, later, of course, we have Chester Himes, who wrote the series. Uh, some of you may know the film called Cotton Comes to Harlem. That's based on a novel called A Rage in Harlem. Himes was a very successful novelist in the 1950s, and that sort of opened the floodgates, and, and now we have a great diversity of mystery writers. Um, so this play is, uh, has never been published. Um, the script came from the, the New York Public Library, I believe, uh, and which you, where you can find it if you really have to have a copy of it. Uh, but we're hopeful that the play will see a greater audience at some point. Who knows? Maybe even film producers out there will say, this deserves production. So that concludes our presentation of, of uh, The Conjure Man Dies. You'll have to read the book to solve the crime. But we will take questions for the actors, uh, the library staff, or me about this or the series. Um, and I should, let me say a, a word or two about the series before we launch into that. Um, the series spans the period 1867 uh, with the first American mystery novel called The Dead Letter uh, to 1960. Um, and that's sort of our aim, is that century of crime fiction. Um, there are many titles that have gotten lost, that haven't gotten the attention they deserve. We're not trying to be politically correct in the titles that we choose. Um, we're trying to pick books that are evocative of the time periods and that may offend some people to remember our own history. Uh, but we think it's important that we do remember who we are and where we came from. Questions? Questions, comments, rebuttals? Yes. Yes, there's a microphone here. This is Vanessa Ackham with the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Thank you for the presentation. This is questions for Hannah. I'm curious about your thoughts of working with this um, project and your impressions. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, it's been a great privilege to work on this project. I think, as Les said, these books are snapshots of the time in which they were written, and they really provide the opportunity to think about um, socio-political history, cultural history, and just so many different threads of history, but hopefully in an engaging and accessible way, because you still want to find out who did it. Speaking of who did it, I, f I forgot to mention um, that in the course of putting uh, this book together, uh, we looked into Dr. Fisher and uh, we found his last surviving relative, um, his granddaughter named Laurel Fisher. Um, she lives in, uh, in Illinois. And I reached out to her, I mean, I, using the internet, found her, called her up, and she was thrilled that we were publishing her grandfather's book. And you'll see in this edition that we have some memories of her grandfather uh, that she contributed. The interesting part of the story is she had no idea that she owned the copyrights to this book. <laughs> Other questions, comments? This young woman here has a little something to do with the series. Becky Clark. Hey, I'm Becky Clark. I'm director of the publishing office. And I thought it would um, be helpful, Hannah, if you could say a little bit about how, how we chose the cover for the book and where that cover comes from. Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, all the cover art on all the books in the series does come from the library's collections. And we have a fantastic prints and photographs collection at the library, um, which has literally millions of images to choose from. We try to find ones um, that we can get permission to use or are in the public domain and that have something to do with the contents of the book, of course. So we did um, do a lot of research trying to find something from the Harlem Renaissance from that era and never found the right fit because if you think about it, the image has to um, relate to the plot but not give something away, not be too graphic or disturbing, considering it is, you know, murder we're talking about. Um, we have to be able to get permission, and it also has to fit the aspect ratio of the design 
of the template for the series. So it's a tall ask for a single work of art. And this is actually a photograph by Camilo Jose Vergara, who's a very talented um, documentary photographer who has done many, uh, for many decades has been photographing urban neighborhoods and how they've changed over time in the United States. So this is a mural in Harlem um, that no longer exists actually, but we thought that the abstract use of colors the clear um, infrastructure of the urban environment related to the Conjure Man dies and its setting, even though it was a photo taken in 2010, not 1932. Thanks. By the way, for more about the series, um, please visit the Library of Congress publishing table down in the, in the, uh, on the lowest floor, where we actually have free books and uh, a calendar showing uh, the 12 titles so far that, that we've published so far. Yes. Uh, hi, yes, I've got a, a question for the amazing actors uh, today. Um, yeah, give them a hand, they deserve it. So I wanna ask you guys, each of you individually, uh, for your characters that you're playing, you played in this short little excerpt, uh, what drew you to them specifically and how did you kind of find your way in to them? Come on up. Come on up. Show off. <laughs> hello, hello. Oh, this. Still this yeah, 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 we're still mic'd. Okay. Um, I love mysteries. <laughs> I'm I'm a huge mystery fan. When we talked about this and we talked about me being Dr. Archer, I was like, yeah, sign me up. I'm I'm all for it. I was even willing to just be the conjure man, just lying. <laughs> so, Dream roll. <laughs> right, right. I was like super psyched about it. Um, but no, I, I'm a huge, huge mystery novel fan. Um, I'm into Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes and all those things. Um, I loved the like Nancy Drew computer games growing up. <laughs> yep. I could talk about mysteries all day. So yeah, and this, this character is just so cool and so composed and steady. And I, I really wanted to bring that out. And I hope I did. I hope I, hope I did that for you. And Archer, by the way, Archer is not a detective. I mean, he's this doctor who finds himself in the middle of the mystery and intrigued by it and uh, really is the deep thinker of the book. <laughs> and Bubba is a real detective. <laughs> uh, I was a, uh, what about Bubba Brown? Well, I am Bubba Brown, basically. I, I talk far too much. I talk far too fast. When we were rehearsing, they're like, can you just slow down? And I was like, oh, right, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, I, uh, I'm a busybody who is in too many people's business. I, I, I admit it, I'm far too nosy, too. So it, I was like, oh, just be myself on stage? Cool, <laughs> easy, <laughs> done. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, fully like uh, just his, uh, both his kind of uh, uh, ribbing of Jinx and but also like, don't you dare get caught or I will kill you myself <laughs> is very much how I uh, treat all my friends where I'm like, please be safe. But if you're going to be not safe, just take a buddy with you, please. Something. So yeah, uh, yeah, again, like you said, it's a, it's a great piece. It's really fun. Uh, mysteries are always great to try and solve. I never solve them, so, but it's good. So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, for me, I just, I love the mystery plays, but I also love like the Harlem Renaissance mm -hmm. in that era, that time period. I think um, Jinx Jenkins, like for him, it, it's so interesting because these characters and their time period where they're living is, can be very reflective of how we are now, like how we were learning, um, we are hearing earlier. And um, so with that, it was just trying to connect into the reality of like, oh, wow, I'm in this situation. I don't even know what's going on for real. I'm just trying to figure out why my handkerchief is in the, <laughs> his throat and <laughs> trying to solve those things. So just kind of leaning into that and just realizing that these stories really do reflect like society and how it's changed over time. And so I, I really just enjoy like the Harlem Renaissance, that time period for that. So, yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Josiah Weaver. I'm from Connecticut, and I'm 12 years old. Hey, hey, hey um, all right. All right. I have a question about for the actors. Um, how did you did did I have a question? Did you incorporate the feelings that you had, like let's say happy, or you know, 
sad or just feel real feelings that you felt deep feelings or like feelings that that you <laughs> felt I don't know how to word yeah. it <laughs> no I hear what you're saying I hear what you're saying did no. you inc- how did you incorporate that in your acting and um, I understand because I I attend the Harlem School of Arts and I'm 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 I I'm in Harlem a lot like, with that culture, and it's it's still going on today. Mm-hmm. To be completely honest with you, I mean there are festivals all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean street mm-hmm. festivals, people walking up and down the streets, just really expressing themselves and all that. So it, it's it's really yeah, I understand the play. It's it, this is really amazing. So how do you incorporate those deep feelings that you feel into your acting? Uh, see, uh, one of my old acting teachers, uh, she always said, uh, you find the Venn diagram of where the character is and where you are, and you got to live in that space in between. So, like, you, you should, like I said, like, bubber is me, basically. So you should never, uh, never not bring your own feelings into it. It's kind of like you got to, uh, like you said, it's still going on today. Even if this play was written in 1930, the feelings that they feel are still very real, still very uh, prescient, still very uh, uh, human, basically. So you should never not bring your entire self to a performance. So it is very much like, like just finding that humanity of the character in... Uh, finding that humanity of the character and then injecting your own humanity into it. Yeah. Mm. Just adding on to it. First, I like that HU shirt you got on right there. Yeah, HU, H-U. you know. <laughs> um, but uh, also, like, like he was just saying very well, um, I think, too, just given the circumstances, like you said, Harlem is still doing this now, so you can probably see yourself in this world as well. So once you have the circumstances and the, this team here at the Library of Congress, they gave us a lot of research about the era and about the time period and seeing pictures of the productions when they were doing it at the Lafayette Theater in 1936. You just get that whole framework and then just be in that space and then allow whatever feelings come up to just live truthfully through you. So, uh. Yeah, yeah. And, and to what they were saying, I also feel like every space that you step into has its own set of emotions. Mm-hmm. And, and you move through that as, as a human being, as a character, when, whenever you take on any role, you can just feel it when you walk into a room or you walk into a certain spot in the room, you're like, man, I feel really happy right here. Or I feel like really scared right here. Mm-hmm. So. I, I try to take that into account with every show I do. I'm like, what is this space given to me? Like, what is it telling me? What, what feedback am I getting that I can take into myself and, and put it forward as the character? So, uh, I, yeah. Just, just to make sure you it. get the idea, but this is an undertaker's place here. We've got two corpses, and uh, the conjure man <laughs> is, a, is a psychic for hire. I mean, he basically predicts people's futures. So you got this, uh, what's the line about back to Jordan? Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, Jordan, 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 Jordan. Yeah, you got an undertaker on the ground floor, the church, the church the basement, on the second floor, undertaker. and the conjure man on the second floor. It's, it's, uh, I love the, the, the supernatural element here, the, the, the fright. And by the way, kudos to uh, Becky Clark and Hannah Fries who produced two corpses for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no, Thank you. Uh, what was your name? Josiah, you said? Yes, my name's Josiah Weaver. And I forgot I'm attending the Harlem School of Arts for Theater. Yeah, everybody give it up for Josiah. Give it up for yeah. Josiah, yeah. yeah man. He's Thank gonna be so on the stage soon. Look right. Out. Look out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Come on up to the microphone here. Yeah. Hi, so when talking about the series, I know there was a difficult decision to decide which books to include. I was wondering if there are any that stick out to you that made it into the collection or any that didn't make the cut that you'd still like to champion? <laughs> well, we, we have a lot more to go. Um, so if they haven't made the cut yet, there's still, if you want one of your favorites that you're waiting for, don't give up. Um, we have three more in production already, uh, and uh, we're going to be putting out pretty much four a year forever. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, or until we run out of steam here. Um, in terms of favorites, I love The Conjure Man. It's just, it's one of my absolute favorites, but there's so many. Uh, we just finished uh, uh, a, a terrific book called The Master of Mysteries, uh, which is just great stuff. Uh, uh, interestingly, another psychic, uh, Astro the Seer, is the detective, and uh, he's a, he admits he's a fake psychic, but he uses his powers of observation to solve very real crimes. Um, 
one of the more important books, is, I mean, as I said, we span from early to late, The Dead Letter, 1867, the first American mystery novel by a woman named Celie Register. Um, it's an interesting, it's a longish novel um, about a letter that shows up years after it was sent, providing a vital clue to the solution of a crime. Uh, on up to the most recent in the series, um, in terms of chronology, is um, Case Pending by Del Shannon, not the rock and roller, but the other Del Shannon, who had a very, very successful career as a mystery writer, and this is one of her first. It's about the uh, Hispanic police detective, uh, uh, Lu Luis um, Mendoza, Men Mendoza uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and so, sort of everything in between. Another one of my favorites is The Rat Began to Gnaw the Rope by C.W. Grafton. For those of you who are mystery readers, this was Sue's father, um, who had his own success as a mystery writer. He wrote, wrote three novels that were well regarded. Um, and it's set in the 1940s, and it's one of the very first sort of humor, wisecracking um, detective, private detective kind of novels. So. There's so many. Uh, I'm, I can't pick out a favorite. It's like, which of your children do you like best? <laughs> Thank you for that insight into the series. Thank you. Uh, it's Becky Clark again. I just want to point out, uh, uh, we've got three incredibly talented actors up here who did uh, exactly one rehearsal <laughs> for 45 minutes just yesterday. So I w w wish you good morning. Ah, <laughs> come on. Yeah, you know, imagine if you'd had two. <laughs> <laughs> the whole place. Right? Someone bring up the book. Did we'll you want to ask a question over there? You're just wandering around, so. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. And as I said, stop by the table downstairs. So. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>